Well, praise be to God. We thank you, Jesus, for the Word of God. Thank you for the truth of the Word of God. It's so good to see everybody today. This week we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We celebrate Passover. And I want to share with you this morning a little bit about Passover. We've been sharing a bit in these clips. Um, and uh, if you haven't ever celebrated Passover, uh, we urge you to do so with your family. We have some Haggadahs, or Haggadahs, however you pronounce them, out there. And uh, basically the Haggadah, uh, or Haggadah is the, the order. And um, call it, you know, Passover is called the Siddhar, or Seder. It's pronounced differently in different places. And basically the word Seder is, means the telling. And that's really what, um, what Passover is all about, is we celebrate Passover. And of course, when we come together and have what we call communion, we are actually exercising a very small uh, memorial Seder, because that's what we do when we have communion. Um, we've kind of narrowed communion down over the years to a wafer or a cracker or a piece of bread and a little cup of juice or wine. But really, communion comes from the Passover celebration or meal that the children of Israel partook of in Egypt when they were in bondage. And in Exodus chapter 12, we have the very first mention of Passover and what God was instituting with the children of Israel. And I want to read this portion of Scripture to you this morning and speak to you a little bit about Passover and why Passover is such a powerful, powerful message. And you may wonder, well, <clears throat> we're New Testament believers, Pastor Tim. Why do we keep talking about Jewish stuff and Old Testament stuff? We're New Testament believers. Well, we, of course we're New Testament. But the New Testament is all contained in the Old Testament. And the New Testament and Passover and what we celebrate really doesn't make any sense if we don't understand the Old Testament. We know in part we have a partial picture of the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's so important that we know the history behind things. We know where that came from and what it was all about, and that's what Passover is about. And in Exodus chapter 12, uh, God gives the children of Israel the Passover. And this is where we have received this message of redemption. It was God showing the children of Israel how He was going to send a substitution for their sins called the Passover lamb. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the things God told the children of Israel that when they came into the promised land, they were to tell these things to their children. They were to remember them. Uh, the Bible is a very narrative book. It's a storybook. It's the story of redemption. It's the story of creation and man's rebellion and fall into sin and then God's plan to redeem and bring people back. And not only people, but bring the world back in, and the planet itself back into fellowship with Him and s set it free from the bondages of sin and darkness. And so the, that's why the Jewish people in their history have told the story. It's about reciting the story. We remember stories. We remember when people tell us stories. And, and so when you look at the Bible, the Bible is a book full of various stories of, of God's dealing with different people and how God brought this nation called Israel into existence through a man called Abraham and his offspring called Isaac and then later Jacob. And how out of this man Jacob, later named Israel, he birthed the nation, which Jacob, of course, had 12 sons, and some of those sons uh, were cut off, and the tribes were cut off later, but basically 12 sons, which we call the 12 patriarchs, and all the tribes of Israel were named after the sons of Jacob, or Israel. And uh, when God calls Jacob into, uh, to, and has an encounter with him, and Jacob wrestles with God all night, and he comes away, and he says, your name is no longer to be called Jacob, which the word Jacob means usurper, uh, usurper. The name, uh, you're now to be called Israel, which means prince. And God takes <clears throat> this man called Israel, they end up through supernatural events, through, through famine, going into, Israel, into Egypt, and um, 
the story, of course, we have the story of Joseph, where Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers, and God uses Joseph supernaturally, who is a type of Christ, and uh, Joseph uh, is raised up supernaturally in a moment out of the dungeon to the highest place in, in Egypt, next to the king, uh, the pharaoh of Egypt, and Joseph literally becomes the instrument of God, like Christ is the instrument of God to redeem and save his people. And of course the story goes, as we have seen this morning, that after time, after Joseph dies and that uh, another J a Pharaoh comes along who doesn't remember Joseph or doesn't respect the God of Israel that Joseph worshipped. And the Bible says, when the time of the promise drew near, uh, there arose another Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And uh, what happens? The children of Israel, God prophesied that your descendants Abraham would be in a foreign land for 400 years. And so what happens? The children of Israel become oppressed. They become slaves and they become oppressed by their taskmasters in Egypt. And the Egyptians make life very difficult for them. And out of that hardship, the people of God begin to cry out to God for a deliverer. And God raises up a Hebrew man among them named Moses. And Moses, of course, being a type of Christ, a type of the deliverer. And God, through his outstretched arm, brings uh, Moses flees because he kills an Egyptian, later is brought back by God through a supernatural encounter at a burning bush. He, God says, go set my people free. And God, through the power of God, brings plagues upon the gods of Egypt. Every one of the 12 plagues upon the gods of Egypt, all the plagues upon the gods of Egypt have to do with judgment on their gods because the Egyptians worshipped all of these different gods. And uh, later, finally, the very last plague that God is going to bring upon them is the death of their firstborn. And this is where Passover comes in, because just before this event, God institutes this, this ongoing celebration or this ongoing commemoration. When they were doing it, it was looking forward to something. We do it looking backwards to something. And uh, in Exodus chapter 12, I just want to read this portion of Scripture and reading verse 1 through 18 through 20. You have a lot of notes this morning, um, and I'm not going to go through all those notes because we just do not have time. Um, but you can take those home and look all of those over. I'm going to give you kind of the condensed version, Lord willing, here this morning. But Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to the house take Take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. In other words, firstborn. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at the twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh of the, on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall, not let, you shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it, with your belt on your waist, and your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your... In your uh, in your hand, so you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, uh, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses of e uh, in Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it at, as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, 
On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation, this means a holy observance, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation, for uh, no uh, manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone uh, must eat, the only, only may be prepared by you. Verse 17, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Israel, or of, of Egypt, excuse me. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. So here we have the institution of Passover. The Passover feast is one of what we call the Feast of the Lord. And, in, and God instituted with the nation of Israel commemorations or holy observances we call the Feast of the Lord uh, to give them shadow pictures of something that was to come. And, and in this Passover, in Passover we actually have three different commemorations. We have, the, we have Passover which also begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which ends with what we call uh, the Day of First Fruits. Uh, and um, so these three significant times are put all together and they begin the what we call the sacred year. Uh, if you look at throughout the Bible, the children of Israel and Israel, uh, they actually operated when they came into the land. There's two different calendars and in Israel today, Israel operates by two calendars uh, because Israel celebrates their new year on Rosh Hashanah, which is the day of trumpets, but that's not really the biblical new year. The biblical new year is Passover according to the Bible, because the Bible says right here that this is the beginning of your year. And this would fall in the month of Asan or Nisan, which, which is basically comes about our, um, this time of year. Uh, because the, the, uh, the Jewish calendar, the biblical calendar, is a lunar calendar, not a solar calendar. We on the, in the West operate by based on a solar calendar. Uh, from a biblical perspective, a day. So when you're reading the Bible and they say it was uh, at sundown and so on, the, the Jewish day began when the sun set wherever you were at. And, this, and it, a full day was from sundown to sundown, no matter where you were at. Now that takes a little getting your head around because we tend to think of a day begins at midnight. Um, and so, and you also have to recognize when you read the scripture, it'll say, well, it's the third hour of the day, or it was the sixth hour of the day. Well, you say, well, that's not the day, because the sixth hour would begin counting from six o'clock in the morning till whatever time. Now, that's not the beginning of the Jewish day, but it's a common way that they counted, because at six o'clock was kind of considered, okay, you start your day of work. Um, you're not going to go to work during the night, right? So that was why you see that. It was the third hour of the day, which meant nine o'clock, or it was the sixth hour of the day, or Jesus gave up the Spirit at uh, this time of the day. So that's how we figure it, from six in the morning to that time during the day. So this is why God told them to kill the lamb at sundown, because once the sun set, and this is true of Orthodox Judaism, it's always been true uh, from a biblical perspective, for instance, the, the week Sabbath what began at Friday when the sun set. Once the sun went down, the day began and you could not work anymore. So everything had to be done before sundown. And uh, so this is why God said, on this day you shall do no, it begins with a holy commemoration, in other words, a Sabbath, and it ends with a Sabbath, right? And so during those days, those are Sabbaths. You don't go out and work. You, you do all, it's a Sabbath and, uh, and so forth. Um, so it's pretty cl clear. He says, for seven days you're not to eat bread with yeast in it or leavening. And this is why during Passover to this day we, we use what's called matzah, which matzah means unleavened. And that's what matzah is, basically an unleavened piece of bread. Uh, and why did God tell them to remove the leavening? 
because leavening in Scripture often is referred to as a type of pride or sin. Uh, you know, if you put leavening or yeast in bread, what happens to it? Yeast by nature, if you've ever looked at yeast, it begins to expand and swell, uh, and that's what makes bread rise. And so, just like pride in our life, what does pride do? It swells and it grows and it gets bigger and bigger. And so, God is telling them, it's get the pride out of your life, humble yourself. It's about humility. And that's what coming to Christ and about salvation is about. It's about humility before God and removing, removing the leavening or the sin from life. And so for seven days they were to eat bread without leavening. For seven days they were to not have leavening in their house. And into this day, uh, Jewish people, when they celebrate Passover, they have a ritualistic cleansing. Now, let me just fill you in on something about Judaism. Uh, uh, we love the Jewish people, praise be to God, but a lot of modern day Judaism isn't really biblical at all. The Jewish people in modern Judaism, and this happened actually even before Jesus came along, a lot of what we see in modern Judaic practices is ritualism. It's not biblical, you can't find it in the Bible. There's a lot of things in Jewish customs and practices uh, well, there's a lot of rich history in what we're doing and learning these feasts of the Lord, learning uh, the roots of our faith, which is, which is Israel. The roots of our faith is, is, is Jewish history. But a lot of modern Jewish practices, they aren't biblical at all. I mean, there's a lot of Jewish people that they celebrate Passover, and it has basically very little Jewish or very little scriptural basis whatsoever. Uh, and Judaism kind of was taken over by the traditions of the elders and became very ritualistic, departed from scripture. On our study on Wednesday nights, we're doing a study on the Gospel of John. And one of the things John bears out with the ministry of Jesus is Jesus literally rejected the authority of the elders in Judea uh, and basically said they're illegitimate because they had departed from the scripture. This is why Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees. He said, you go over, you go over the uh, ocean to try to make a single convert and you turn them into twice the child of hell you are yourselves. I mean, he was really hard on them because basically what he was saying is, you have perverted and twisted and uh, basically departed from the teachings of the scripture. So, so we have to kind of keep that in perspective. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to be like what, what the church has been since, you know, Constantine, where, well, well, you know, we're New Testament now, and why are you talking about Jewish things? Because, you know, God forsook the Jewish people. And we know that's not true. Uh, and so we have such rich heritage. And, and the feasts of the Lord are so powerful because we have spring feasts and we have fall feasts. The spring feasts of the Lord talk of the first coming of Christ. The fall feasts of the Lord talk of the second coming of Christ. They're very prophetic. And in the spring feast of the Lord, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover, and the first fruits, and then Pentecost, which is the very day that the Holy Spirit was poured out in the earth, um, we see the power of the first coming of Christ in the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And um, it was through this Feast of Passover that God gave us this amazing picture of redemption. God was literally painting a, a, a dress rehearsal for the children of Israel every year to practice this feast. And when Christ came and died on the cross and then was raised again from the dead, Christ fulfilled to the very day and hour this feast. Christ was crucified on the day of Passover. He was put in the grave before sunset on the dawning or the eve of Passover. He was raised from the dead on the day of first fruits. Christ, our Passover lamb, is crucified for us, Paul said. Christ became the first fruits of those who have been raised from the dead. Christ entered, today we celebrate Palm Sunday, the day when Christ entered, when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a uh, colt. And um, he entered Jerusalem on the very day that the priests would go to Bethlehem to pick out the Passover lambs. And it was a big celebration. And when he entered into Jerusalem, all the people began crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Because every year they would do that with the Passover lambs 
processional coming into Jerusalem, and Jesus just kind of cuts them off at the pass and comes in, and so all the people, when they see Yeshua, they start crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, fulfilling prophecy that, yes, he is the son of David, and he's come, praise God, as the living Lamb of God to sacri be sacrificed for our sins. Of course, they didn't recognize this, because this was a mystery hidden in God. And, uh, but Jesus was, was crucified while they were killing the Passover lambs up at the Temple Mount. And before they killed the last Passover lamb, the high priest would, somebody would wipe his brow and then he would say, it is finished, and he'd cut the throat of the last Passover lamb of the day. And at that very moment was the same moment Jesus cried out, Father, it is finished, and the temple veil was rent from the top to the bottom by an angel signifying this way of brick and mortar, this way of God being distant from people and having to go through an earthly priest of the Levitical tribes, that is done. I have now made a new and living way through my flesh, through the veil of my flesh. And so when Christ was raised from the dead, the old way of temple worship was done. And a new and living way of our being the temple of the Holy Ghost had come. So we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's what the whole letter to the Hebrews is about, is how that Christ was not after the order of the Levitical priesthood. Those were all things that had to do with the fallen nature of man, and God made a way for people to come to him that people could relate to, but man was still fallen. But when Christ came and shed his blood, he abolished the ongoing blood sacrifices. Why? Because his blood, once and for all, covered and took away the, not covered, but took away the sins of the world. And so the Bible tells us in Hebrews that Jesus is not after the order of Melchizedek, or after the order of the Levitical priesthood. His priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, having neither beginning nor end, supernatural ordained by God. So praise be to God. But in these, in these feasts, we get amazing shadow pictures of redemption. Now, I want to draw your attention to something here that we oftentimes skip over. If you notice something God puts right in the text, he talks about the strength with you, right? Because we kind of get this idea that when the Jewish people celebrated Passover, it was just Jewish people. But it was always strangers with them as well. Why? Because God was painting to the Jewish picture. It was always God's intention to win the whole world to God through the nation of Israel. That was always God's intention. Salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Jesus, when he met the woman at the well, he said, salvation is of the Jews. Amen? Amen? But because of Israel's apostasy and their falling by the wayside in rebellion against God, God had to have another means of doing that, but God has not abandoned the nation of Israel. But this is why all of the feasts of the Lord and all of the provisions of God had a, had a way for the non-Jewish people, we, the Gentiles, to come in. For instance, the Bible talks about when, when you, when you uh, reap your field, when you harvest your field, you're not to harvest the corners of your field because you're to leave a, some of the grain left for the stranger and the Gentile, or the, the, the poor and the Gentile. So God in that was instituting the fact that I have a me method and a plan, not for just the nation of Israel, but for the Gentiles, and that's us, non-Jewish born people that can come into the kingdom. Christ came for not just Jewish people, he came for all people. He's the savior of the whole world, amen? amen? And Jew and Gentile alike have to come to Christ through Messiah. Jewish people aren't saved because they're Jewish, they're saved because of Messiah. If they don't humble themselves and call upon Messiah, they cannot be saved either. People are not saved because they're born Jewish. There are many people that pr try to preach that today. Well, if you're born Jewish, you're saved. No, you are not. It's only the blood of Messiah that saves you. Just like in this shadow picture we had here, what did he tell them? Every household is to take a lamb. And you're to take the lamb, and everyone is to eat of the lamb. A lamb for a household. So what does that tell us there? Well, remember Jesus made some mention of this. He said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no portion with me. And of course they couldn't handle that because he didn't explain himself. That's what I love about the ministry of Jesus. He said a lot of things and he didn't explain himself. 
And he said things sometimes that were offensive to people and he didn't explain himself. But of course he didn't mean that we're to literally drink his blood and eat his flesh. Because according to scripture, we weren't allowed to. The Jewish people were not allowed to drink blood. It was, that was something the pagans did. They weren't even to eat meat with blood in it. They weren't to eat meat strangled. And when the non-Jewish believers came into the church and the Jews in, in Antioch, they were trying to figure out, what do we do with these Gentiles? Do we teach them the Torah? Do we teach them all these kosher laws? And, and they stood up and they said, no. You know, this is what we tell them. Abstain from sexual immorality and don't eat meat with blood in it. One of them specifically was don't commit sexual immorality and don't, uh, don't eat meats that's been, you know, and, oh, don't eat meats uh, sacrificed to idols. That was the other one. Right. Because all meat, unless you went to a kosher market in those days by Jewish people, every piece of meat you'd buy had been sacrificed and dedicated to a pagan idol. And so he didn't want them doing that. He wanted them to come out of that paganism. But you notice God doesn't say to the Gentiles, you know what the first thing you need to do is you need to dress like a Jewish person and act like a Jewish person. I always get a kick out of uh, Gentiles today that want to become Jewish. I'm not Jewish. I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I'm a Gentile. So let's not try to become Jewish on the outside because it's not about the outward trappings, guys. I don't think it really matters. And this is my point. We can't get trapped up in the, in the outward trappings of all this stuff. It's not about the outward, it's about the inward. It's about your heart. It's about being obedient to the word of the Lord. Amen? Now, I love the Jewish stuff. Uh, you know, again, we urge you to keep Passover. Do a Passover, you know, in these feasts of the Lord. I think they're rich with, with meaning because when you see Christ in the Passover, it's like, wow, what a, what a revelation this is. Um, but again, you don't have to get hung up on, like, I can't say Hebrew words and I don't know what the order. It really doesn't matter. The whole thing behind the Passover is telling the story. I mean, even if you opened your Bible with your family and read Exodus chapter 12. As a matter of fact, I'm going to urge you to do something. You know, one of the things I like to tell people and families to do, like at Christmas, which I love Christmas, and we have certain family traditions that we do at Christmas and certain things that we've done over the years, that they're meaningful to me because I grew up with them. And I think that's important with families to establish tradition. I mean, if you've ever seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof, and if you've never seen that movie, you should watch it. It's a really good movie. Um, but one of the things in the movie is Tevya is, is struggling with a changing world, and he's always talking about tra traditions. Because it is tradition. Paul said, I worship God after the traditions of my fathers. So sometimes we think that traditions are all bad, like, well, that's just tradition. And I was just talking about that, wasn't I? But traditions aren't bad if they don't contradict the Word of God. It's when traditions usurp the Word of God. And that's what Jesus was talking to the Pharisees about. He said, you, you replace the Word of God with the traditions of men. That's when tradition becomes bad. When tradition becomes more, uh, takes more authority than the Word of God, then tradition becomes bad. But as long as tradition doesn't contradict the Word of God, it's fine. And I think it's important to establish traditions in your life. I think it's good to establish traditions for holidays. Uh, and I think it's good to establish traditions for, for Passover in this time of year. Now, traditionally, this is a tradition. We uh, traditionally kind of hand out poems. It just signifies, it's something physical that you can kind of like, oh yeah, this is, you know, of course they have bigger poems, uh, nicer poems than we have, but that was common in, they would come into, the people would come into Jerusalem by the thousands, and uh, they would cut uh, the greenery off trees, and they would decorate their homes, and, and they would take palm fronds and green, uh, evergreen fronds and uh, branches, and they'd wave them and celebrate. This is especially on the day of what we call triumphant entry. Uh, that was when this Passover lamb was coming in. So it was a big celebration. Uh, I think it's important to have celebrations in your home around this time of year. Um, you know, I urge you, um, there's great, great, uh, you know, I always like to watch the Ten Commandments during, you know, Cecil D. V. DeMille's Ten Commandments. Now, you, d don't be a Pharisee and say, oh my gosh, it's not all, it's not accurate. Well, if you know the Bible well enough, you can watch it and go, oh yeah, that's not accurate. Uh, but I would, you know, watch that. Uh, if you've never seen Ben-Hur, that's an awesome movie about the power of God. 
I would say don't watch the new Ben-Hur, it's terrible. It really is bad. The script in it is horrible. Um, but the old Ben-Hur with Charlton Hester has a powerful, powerful encounter with Jesus Christ in just a really powerful message of forgiveness and redemption. And so those are great, great shows to just remember what Christ did. You know, if you can stomach it, uh, it's a little hard to watch, but the movie The Passion, the Mel Gibson movie The Passion, uh, which I have to admit, it's hard to watch that movie. It's, it's, it's you know, it, but it's good. It, it'll make you cry, and it should make you cry. And that's only one aspect. And in that movie, the, this video we watched this morning from that movie, um, Jesus looked, I'll guarantee you, he looked a lot worse than that. <laughs> he was beaten a lot worse than that. But back to our regular scheduled message here. Um, so the spring feasts of the Lord are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and then um, a Pentecost, which came 50 days after the day of, pa uh, day of first fruits. By the way, the children of Israel celebrated the first Passover at Mount Sinai, Sinai when God met with them and gave them the Torah, the law, the commandments that Moses had. That was exactly 50 days after they left Egypt. It was exactly 50 days from the day of first fruits, the resurrection of Christ, that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Amen. And in that we see the two covenants. And it's common in traditional Pentecost uh, Shavuot celebration. What do they do? They bake two loaves of bread. And both of those loaves of bread, we could say they commemorate two different things. The nation of Israel and the Gentiles. We could also say they represent the old and the new covenants. Praise be to God. And uh, so then we have, of course, the fall feast of the Lord, which is the day of... Um, you know, Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, which is considered the most solemn and holy day in all of Israel. We have the Day of the Blowing of the Shofar, Rosh Hashanah, which symbolic and represents the second coming of Christ. Amen? Um, and then we have Yom, we have uh, the Day, the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, which I believe is when Jesus will return. Now, Jesus fulfilled the spring feast of the Lord to the very day and hour, and he has not yet fulfilled the fall feast of the Lord, but he will fulfill them to the day and the hour. I believe wholeheartedly that Jesus will return on one of the days of the feast of the, the day of the uh, Rosh Hashanah, the blowing of the shofar. We have a lot of indication of that in the New Testament. It says that the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the shofar of God. So we have a lot of indication of that, that Jesus could return. If he, if he was crucified on the day of Passover, why wouldn't he return on the day of uh, Rosh Hashanah, or the blowing of the shofar? And he'll set up his kingdom during the feast, the time of tabernacles. Well, our message, we don't want to get too bogged down in that this morning. Like I said, I'm going to give you some overview, and you'll have the notes to really flesh this out a little bit more as you take this home. But you may, people wonder, why was Jesus crucified on Passover and not Yom Kippur, if Yom Kippur is considered the most holy day in the nation of Israel, and the most solemn day? Because Passover represents personal salvation. Passover is about our personal relationship with God, our personal salvation. Because everybody eats the lamb. Each person must partake of Christ. Every person must take the lamb. You and I have to have a personal encounter with the living God through the lamb of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's a personal salvation. And so Passover was originally set up as a personal. Remember, it was a family. He didn't call the whole nation to come together as a nation because he said this is for a family. Each family must eat the lamb. Each family must apply the blood. And what does that represent? Each heart must have the blood applied to its individual heart. Passover. Yom, Rosh Hashanah, or excuse me, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, has to do with the nation of Israel and the the sins of the nation. And I believe that God will restore the nation of Israel to its fullness on the day of Yom Kippur when Jesus comes back to set up his kingdom. Amen?
So, but uh, that's a whole nother 10 messages and we don't want to even try to get into those this morning. But God told him to take a lamb on the evening of the 14th day, you're to cake it on the 10th day of the month of Nisan and keep it for till the evening of the 14th. And during that time, you're to inspect it, you're to make sure it doesn't have a spot or blemish. And on the evening of the 14th, you're to kill it and you're to take and roast it with fire and you're to take the blood and spread it on the top of the door and the sides of the door. And he said, then when the, the angel comes, the destroyer comes, he will pass over you literally says, I will pass over you and not permit the destroyer to kill you, basically is what he's saying. So what we have in, in Passover is we have two elements. We have the judgment of God that is coming to destroy, right? He's called the destroyer. And anyone who is, any household that does not have the blood applied to the door representing our lives. If the blood's not there, the destroyer's going to look and there's no blood. So the destroyer is going to come in and kill the firstborn. If the blood is there, the destroyer will see it and he will pass over and not, not destroy anybody in that house. And the Bible tells us that when this took place, that every family in Egypt had somebody that was dead. Because if the blood wasn't there, judgment came. In this we see the ultimate picture of redemption in Christ. See, it's the blood of Christ that causes the judgment of God to pass over our lives. The Bible says it's an appointed on a man once to die and then the judgment. If the blood of Christ has not been applied to our lives through the new birth, if we've not surrendered to Christ, humbled ourselves, and allowed Christ to remove the leavening of sin from our lives, then we have no blood applied to our hearts and the judgment of God will come upon us. That's why every person who dies outside of Christ, they will be judged by God because their sin remains. You know, and we live in a culture today that doesn't like to talk about blood and sacrifices and we want to, it may even be offensive. The Bible says that the cross of Christ is an offense to people. Um, but I want to tell you that it's not an offense to God because the Bible tells us very plainly that without the shedding of blood there is no removal of sin. And you say, well, why did God set that up? Because the Bible tells us that life is in the blood. When Cain killed Abel, when Cain killed Abel, God said, his blood cries out to me from the ground. There's something about the blood of something, the blood of a living animal, that that blood has life in it, that blood is powerful. There's an amazing book by Dr. Dr. Richard Swenson about the miracle of the blood and how blood is so supernatural. It really is just amazing how God designed bodies and what blood does. It, it's just amazing. Um, and the blood of Jesus Christ is, of course, the most amazing blood because it had no spot. It had no sin within it. And so the blood has to be applied to our hearts. And this is what Passover is about. So every time we receive communion, what do we do? We commemorate the Lord's death till He comes. That's what Passover was. Every year you're to do this. God said every year you're to do this. Why? Because every year you're to tell of the Lord's Passover. So what were they doing? Every year they would tell the story. How they were in bondage in Egypt. And how their lives were bitter. And made hard because of the, the oppression of the Egyptians. But God turns our bitterness into, into joy. He turns our sorrow into rejoicing. God delivers us. And, God, and what did the children of Israel tell for generation upon generation upon generation? Hey our ancestors were in bondage in Egypt and life was hard for them but God supernaturally brought them out with his outstretched arm and he supernaturally delivered them from their enemies and he brought them into this land and he preserved them as a people for generation after generation after generation they told the story they recounted and really proclaimed the glory of God amen they, they rejoiced in what the Lord has done look and see what the Lord has done and so when they went into the promised land, they just kept telling this story every year, every year. And then when it came over into the New Testament, what happened? When Jesus actually died as the actual Lamb of God, fulfilling what they had practiced for thousands of years, and Paul, by the Spirit of God, puts things all together because he understood the Scriptures, and he goes, Christ our Passover Lamb is sacrificed for us. 
and he's become the first fruits of those who have risen from the dead. On the day of first fruits, the priest would take and go out, and you would take a, they would gather a, a small uh, group of um, stalks of, of barley, and they would shake it, wave it in the air unto the Lord as a, as a worship to the Lord, representing this is the first fruits of the barley harvest, and it was an act of worship. But little did they know that every year when they were doing that, they were testifying to one day the first fruits is going to rise from the dead called Messiah, Yeshua. And Jesus arose from the dead on the day of first fruits. Glory to God. He became the first fruits among many brethren, and we're part of those fruits. Glory to Jesus. We've been, he's been raised up, and, and we have been gathered in as a harvest unto him. And so, praise be to God. So, Paul, when, when we celebrate communion, all, whenever we take communion, what does Paul say in, in Romans, or I mean 1 Corinthians chapter 12? He says, I received from the Lord that which was delivered unto me. And he talks about on the night in which he was betrayed, he took the cup and drank the cup because Jesus celebrated a Siddhar with his, with his disciples and told the story. And they remembered. But he went, took it a bit further. He said, this cup, this cup, it is the new covenant in my blood which will be shed for you for their mission. Not the covering, but the removal of sin. See, the blood of the of goats, the blood of lambs, the blood of bulls, they didn't take away sin. They just covered it. But every year you had to do the same thing. Every year they had to celebrate the Passover. Every year they had to celebrate uh, Yom Kippur and the priest had to sprinkle the people with blood and had to sprinkle the utensils with blood to purify the people so the wrath of God didn't break out on and the Lord was satisfied with their offering. But every year it had to be done. Why? Because in the shedding of that blood there was a remembrance of sin. But in the shedding of the blood of Christ our sins aren't just remembered, they're removed. As far as the east is from the west, so far has removed our transgressions from us. The blood of Christ continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's as if you never sinned. We're justified, made righteous, made right with God as if we had never committed sin at all. This is what the blood of Christ does. Though our sins be as crimson, they shall be white as snow. Glory to God. But every year they tell the story, and this is what the whole communion table is about. And of course, you know, we don't celebrate a big feast like they were doing, but when we take communion, what do we do? Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you remember the Lord's death until He comes. So what do we do in, in the New Testament? We're literally, every time we receive communion, we're having a mini seder, a mini seder. We're telling the story. What's this all about? It's not about just drinking a cup and eating a piece of bread or cracker. It's about what was it about? It was about the sacrifice. It was about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's about the power of God and what God through Christ did and continues to do because the blood of Jesus Christ has power in it. The blood of Jesus Christ has power because it defeated hell, death, and the grave. And Jesus, when he arose from the dead, he stripped the devil of the keys of hell, death, and the grave, and he took authority over them. The Bible says he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He made a public spectacle of the hosts of the devil in his triumph over death. He literally led the devil and all of his legions out before the angelic host and those who have gone before us. He said, this is what death is about now. I hold the keys of hell, death, and the grave. I have the authority that Adam gave away. I am the king of all kings. I am the Lord of all lords. And I will rule supreme. And he put hell and death under our feet. He put them down. And one day the Bible says the last enemy that will be destroyed or defeated is death. It will be no more. Glory to God. And it says then he'll turn the kingdom over to the Father. Glory to God. And rule as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. But praise be to God. God commemorated this with the children of Israel that every year they were to keep the Passover. It was to begin, be the beginning of their sacred year. And uh, they were to rejoice in the Lord. I just want to wrap this up this morning by looking at just a couple of things. I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I have so much here that, uh, like I said, this is about a six-week course, but um, we're going to do it in about ten minutes. Uh, five now. So you remember when Jesus, let's, let's just put this out there because it's so powerful. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
and they haul him before the Sanhedrin and um, they're going to try him and he's tried in Jerusalem and those of you who are following along on our Wednesday nights it's very important it, this is powerful because when we when you start seeing the correlation in the ministry of Jesus Jesus did the majority of his ministry not in Jerusalem and Judea he did the which is in the southern part of Israel he did the majority of his ministry in Galilee which was northern Israel was because he was more welcomed up there because northern Israel the northern people of Israel did not like the Judeans because they didn't like the priests because the priests were corrupt they didn't like the Pharisees because the Pharisees were oppressive and so Jesus didn't spend a lot of time down in Judea ministering because every time he came to Judea he'd run into people that were giving him a hard time because the Pharisees who ran everything and the towns that were loyal to the Pharisees always were challenging his authority and it wasn't until later in his ministry that Jesus really makes a concerted effort to go down to Judea and really challenge the authority of the Pharisees and call them on the carpet for the slime they really became and he didn't have flattering words to say about them and so when the Pharisees, when they arrest Jesus and haul him off to be tried, if you notice something about the trial of Jesus, it was very quick. Number one, it was completely against the scriptures. It was because they didn't follow the scriptures. Nicodemus stands up and says, is it lawful that we condemn a man without being tried first? Is that according to the Torah? And they said, well, are you part of him yourselves? Because they didn't, give a, they didn't care about the Torah. They didn't keep the Torah. They didn't keep the law. They, they said, well, the law, the authority of the supersede the scriptures we are now in command here and that's how they operated they didn't follow the Bible they didn't follow the commandments of, 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 of God but they wanted to get him crucified quickly and there was a couple reasons they wanted to crucify him quickly number one it was approaching Sabbath it was approaching Passover but the other reason they wanted to kill him in a hurry was because if the Jews up in the northern part of the country found out what they were doing, they would be dead themselves because they would have come down there and killed all of them. They didn't have Facebook back then. They didn't have cell phones. So news traveled quickly. And by the time Jesus was crucified and risen again from the dead or crucified and in the grave, it was too late because he'd already been killed by, turned over to the Romans. And by the time word spread to the north that what they'd done, it was far too late. But anyhow, so let's look at a couple of things. Because one of the things you were to do with the lamb, you were to take it on the 10th day of the month, and you were to keep it, and you were to inspect the lamb, and on the evening of the 14th, you were to kill it. And um, I just want to share with you a few things. that The lamb had to be inspected. It had to be found without fault. This is part of so supernatural about how Jesus was crucified. So the lamb had to be without spot and blemish. It had to be inspected and had to have no fault. So let's look at the inspection of Jesus. Pilate in John chapter 8 verse 38 said, I find no fault at all with him. Herod, when he was turned over to Herod in Luke 23, 22 says, why? What evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. Let's read a couple more of these here. Praise be to God. Annas, the priest, the high priest, Jesus answered in him in verse, chapter 18 of, verse, uh, of John's Gospel. Jesus answered him and said, If you have spoken, if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you, why do you strike me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. And Caiaphas in John 18 verse 14 says, Now Caiaphas was he which had given, gave counsel to the Jews or the Judeans that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And then of course what did Judas say? In Matthew's gospel when Judas betrayed him, Judas said when he comes back and he says he cast the 30 pieces of silver and says, I have betrayed innocent blood and goes out and hangs himself. The thief on the cross, the one thief rails against Jesus, says, if you're the Son of God, get us down from here. And the other thief says what? We are condemned men. We deserve what we get. This man has done nothing. And finally, the centurion, when Jesus gave up the spirit, he said, truly, this was a righteous man, a son of the gods. So we see this inspection of Jesus over and over and over and over and over and he qualifies as the spotless lamb of God because was in him was no guile 
in him was no deceit. In him was found no sin. So he qualified to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And when Jesus hung on the cross, God poured upon him the wrath that we deserved. Jesus said it himself in John's Gospel, the third chapter, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Paul said in Galatians that God made him a curse for us. Christ became accursed by God. He became the sacrificial lamb of God. God poured upon Christ our judgment and in turn poured onto us his righteousness. So the innocent dime for the just, I mean for the guilty, Christ the lamb of God just as an innocent lamb had to be sacrificed year after year for the people's sins to point to the fact that this innocent animal must pay for your sins, pointing to the ultimate person of Christ that one day the lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world will die on your behalf the innocent for the guilty so that whoever applies the blood to their lives will not face the wrath of God, but God will pass over and your sins are gone. This is an amazing story. The Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It truly is a salvation. It truly is great. I mean, the story of Passover, the story of redemption is so intricate and so involved and so well planned out by God, it is just mind-bending when you think of all the intricacies about it.